In 1950, Great Britain designed an ultimate landmine, a nuclear one, during the top secret operation Blue Peacock, a project which would have undoubtedly changed the European landscape forever if it had been fully realized. Almost as preposterous as the designed weapon was the suggested heat source to keep components from freezing, an internal chicken coop. The design for the Blue Peacock weapon came from the UK's first atomic weapon project, Blue Danube. The nuclear weapons tested in Blue Danube had a 10 to 12 kiloton blast and were the first operational bombs of their type created by the British after testing Hurricane in 1952, a nuclear fission device that was not intended to be used as a weapon. For the Blue Danube bomb, the British added ballistic-shaped casing to the Hurricane fission device with four fins so it could be directed at a target from a height of 50,000 feet. The plutonium core was changed for a plutonium and uranium-235 core for production. The limited yield of 12 kilotons was used to minimize consumption of rare and costly fissile material and to reduce the risk of having the bomb pre-detonate, with this last reason also serving as a foundation for the decision to have a mixed material core. Designs were drawn to create a 40 kiloton version, but these never materialized. The warhead was surfaced and air tested in 1956 at Maralinga, in Western South Australia, in a joint effort between British, Canadian, and Australian scientists. While the weapon performed as expected, it did have a number of issues. First, and most importantly, was the high cost of the weapon, which would be deemed excessive after the development of the smaller and more potent Redbeard device. Secondly, the Blue Danube used complicated lead acid accumulators instead of the simpler ram air turbine generators or thermal batteries to energize the firing circuits and radar altimeters, which decreased reliability. Finally, the bomb was not engineered to withstand a lengthy service life, limiting any appeal of trying to build and maintain a large arsenal. Still, the Blue Danube, which also went by the names of Small Boy and Special Bomb, had a small production run of 58 units before the British settled on producing Redbeard bombs. These used the fissile core from the Blue Danube, but in smaller and more reliable packaging. The Blue Danube was completely cancelled in 1962, but not before playing a role in the designs of the Blue Peacock operation. Among the early nuclear British projects was Blue Peacock, an effort dedicated to making a nuclear landmine. Before being codenamed Blue Peacock, the project went by the names of Brown Bunny and then Blue Bunny. The Royal Armament Research and Development Establishment received an order from the War Office to develop such a weapon by using a converted Blue Danube in the 1950s. After a few years of work, the nuclear physicist had a working prototype. This new type of landmine counted on a plutonium core wrapped by conventional explosives with two firing pins ready for detonation. The bomb rested inside a steel warhead itself inside of steel casing. The casing was pressurized, and after testing, tilt switches were added to it. Despite the entire project being at the most secretive nature, the size of the casing was so large that it had to be tested outdoors in a relatively public place. A flooded gravel pit close to Seven Oaks in the town of Kent was chosen, although no radiative material was tested to reduce any suspicions about the test. In fact, the British pretended they were testing an insulated container for troops in the field rather than part of a nuclear weapon. The bomb could be detonated by one of three mechanisms. The first was a wire placed at a command post three miles away from the bomb. The second was an eight-day clockwork timer. And finally, the anti-tampering mechanisms developed after testing by a pressure trigger set off by gunfire, movement, or flooding would result in a detonation within 10 seconds. Official reports from Blue Peacock state that the intention of this new weapon was, quote, not only destroy facilities and installations over a large area, but deny occupation of the area to an enemy for an appreciable time due to contamination. In particular, the operation focused on the perceived likelihood of a Soviet invasion of Western Germany. The Second British Army of the Rhine, or BAOR, was set up on August 25, 1945 by the British Liberation Army 
with the goal of managing the military government of the British-occupied German territory. Following the formation of the Federal Republic of Germany, the army became the main force dedicated to the protection of Western Germany and served as the main British contribution to NATO. Starting in 1952, the BAOR Commander-in-Chief was also made NATO Northern Army Group Commander as a way to coordinate deterrence and a potential response to an attack from the USSR. The British Army of the Rhine was scheduled to distribute the 10 Keloton landmines along the North German Plain and some others along the East German border to detonate by either wire or the timer in case tensions increased to the brink of war. The goal was not to let the Soviets cross the Iron Curtain. This defense was to be by any means necessary, including the irradiation of the area to prevent Soviet use. By July of 1957, the Army Council had planned to stock the BAOR with 10 Blue Peacock mines. Each one of the bombs was predicted to explode with 10 kilotons and producing a 640 feet in diameter crater when buried 35 feet underground as intended. Yet there were still issues with Blue Peacock up to that point, not the least of which was the matter of temperature. It turned out that the warhead had to be within a temperature range significantly higher than what the underground European winter cold could offer. One of the main problems faced by the team of engineers was that of maintaining sufficient heat for the Blue Peacock to stay operational. Having the weapon buried underground could likely result in it freezing to the point that the detonator would no longer fire as intended. This could be a particular issue during winter, not only presenting the issue of having the weapon not detonate when intended, but adding the possibility that it could detonate at a later date, perhaps once the snow thawed in spring, blowing up civilians rather than military elements. Various orthodox solutions were considered, such as giving the bombs their own insulating blankets. In 1957, however, British scientists settled on an out-of-the-box proposal, adding a coop of chickens to the casing. The idea behind this was that the body heat produced from the chickens' bodies and droppings would keep the temperature inside of the device to an acceptable level so that all electronic components could work properly. The implementation of this idea would require sealing a few chickens inside the casing with enough oxygen to keep them alive for eight days, along with food and water and plenty of feed to keep them from pecking at wires and ruining the bomb. The idea was that if the bomb was not detonated by the time the chickens expired, it would freeze and turn inoperable. Such a proposal carried a number of uncontrollable factors, such as determining the exact moment at which the bomb could be confirmed to be inoperable, issues with controlling the chickens, and adding risk of accidental detonation. Blue Peacock was officially declassified on April 1st, 2004, and at first the public believed that either the entire project, or at least the section involving chickens, was part of an elaborate April Fool's Day joke. In response, Tom O'Leary from the National Archives has stated that, quote, It does seem like an April Fool, but it most certainly is not. The civil service does not do jokes. After seemingly realizing how preposterous the chicken coop bomb idea was, the British nuclear physicist opted for the more rational method of stuffing the casing with fiberglass pillows. The idea of an eight-day timer remained. Despite overcoming the problem of freezing, Blue Peacock was still doomed by a myriad of issues. Unlike a convenient and compact landmine, the nuclear bomb and casing were huge, with a weight of eight tons and a height of six feet. Transporting, testing, and burying the weapon without mishaps would be beyond challenging. Furthermore, the presence of British soldiers in planned mine areas posed a whole other challenge. While a bomber can drop a nuke and fly away, or a ballistic missile can be directed far from friendly troops, there would have to be an incredibly high level of coordination to save all troops and civilians from the effects of an underground nuke without disclosing its tactical location and possibly compromising it. It would not be able to fire at a moment's notice. Not only that, but detonating a nuclear landmine while being far away posed its own challenges. The detonation wire, which ran for three miles, could potentially be interfered with by the enemy. While the alternative eight-day timer could be activated by a lone soldier, while the rest retreated in case of a Soviet advance, it still risked exploding either too early or too late, actually doing little in terms of visibility for deterrence. Neither method was perfect. The only concern that the British had success addressing in terms of creating a nuclear landmine was the design of the tamper-proof casing. 
Even then, however, it was eventually determined that detonation was best left under human control. British military command began expressing further doubts and concerns with Blue Peacock. The device was too large, heavy, and uncomfortable to deal with in comparison to the Red Beard nukes. Fear of generating radiative fallout on Allied territory made it unattractive, and not only were there high risks involved in using it during war, but it was incredibly difficult to store and manage during peacetime. After nearly leaving the prototype stage, in February of 1958, the Weapons Policy Committee concluded that all work on the project be halted. The two finished prototypes were kept. One is believed to have been tested and destroyed when it actually worked. The only surviving model is kept as part of the historical collection of the Atomic Weapons Establishment, and Europe was saved from having radiation from nuclear landmines separating parts of the continent. <laughs>